Well, good morning, Southside Bible Church. Special welcome as well to any of our visitors. Glad you're here with us to worship our God together. We are currently studying through Paul's epistle to the Romans. If you'll turn to chapter 13. Um, It's been a long time. We've been in Romans for almost four years. Uh, I feel like I'm finally starting to get it. The lights are starting to go off uh, for me. Uh, We've seen some amazing things. In fact, we, we spent all this time journeying up Romans 1 through 11, and we said we got to the the Mount Everest of Revelation at the end of chapter 11, and we looked out at all of God's workings and dealings throughout history, and it was from Him, through Him, and to Him, to God be the glory for all things. And then we stood and sang the doxology together. Then we moved into our therefore in Romans 12.1. So now that we've been redeemed and we've been the blood-bought children of God, we've been made right before our God, therefore, offer up your bodies a living sacrifice to God. We've been hiking up the mountain now. I'm going to call it Christian duty, our, our conduct. What is our living sacrifice to God now as His people? And, and so we went to Mount Everest in Romans 1 through 11, and I'm going to call uh, Romans 13 Mount Denali. So uh, what, what's the highest peak? Mount Elbert. So let, let's just stay in Colorado. The highest peak in Colorado is Mount Elbert. So that there's a higher peak, Mount Everest, where we just look at God's dealings and we worship. And now we've been learning, how do I live? And today we're going to hit the top of the mountain and look out at Christian duty, and we're going to see the summary of the whole thing. This is the next highest mountain there is in the new covenant life. And so we've been looking at some beautiful things in Romans 12 and 13. And what I want you to think as we've been studying it, doesn't it feel different than what Moses gave on Sinai? Thou shall not, thou shall not. Uh, You have all these things. uh, There's lightning, thunder, there's a sword. Disobey and die. Obey, you'll have life. The mountain's shaking so that fear filled all of them. There's just something different in the new covenant. And we've been fleshing out the new offering that is to be made to God. And we don't bring dead animals anymore to the table. We, we bring our lives to be living sacrifices for God. These lives, if I could summarize it, are to be lives of love. Paul said the first thing is we are to go into the body of Christ and use our gifts to build each other up. There is a love for one another that I want to use my gift to see you become more like Jesus Christ. Paul said, let us love without hypocrisy. Let's love with a genuineness from this gospel new heart. Let's have enemy love. Let's love even our our enemies. Let's submit to our governments In chapters 14 through 15 now, he's going to say, how do we love people who have different conscience issues? And these things break up the body of Christ more than anything. And Paul's theme is going to be to love God and love others as we make these decisions for conscience conduct. In the Old Testament, these issues were all spelled out. Here's your law for everything. Now Paul is going to say, what is right or wrong on these things isn't even so much the issue but how you love God and love one another and receive them and bring them into your own home with these differences. Are you, are you starting to get it? I pray that you're just, it's love. He's just gonna, everything he's showing us under the new covenant, our ethic is love. And in case you're not getting it, Paul's gonna climb to the top of the mountain this morning and explain what is the new covenant? What is new life in Christ to look like, how am I going to live? He's going to say it this morning where nobody can miss this. It is so clear. Paul's going to do some mighty things in these verses. If you'll look with me, <laughs> turn to Romans 13, verse 8. So last week we saw we're to render to all what is due them, or the government, tax to whom taxes due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. And now he's going to say, owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. There's an outstanding debt that cannot be paid. Oh, oh, love, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. And so we got some strong words here like fulfilled, summed up. Love is the fulfillment of the law. Very strong, powerful statements. Clear, climactic statements. In fact, I believe these couple of verses tie your whole Bible together. So what we're going to look at is big. And I think we've missed in our day and age and really throughout the history of the world what we're going to look at this morning. People just keep missing this truth. The razor's edge of our Christian ethic as we fall off on either side. We become Pharisees where we we have all the the rules, we keep them externally, and Jesus says, "With, with your mouth you worship me, but your heart is far away. And just people who love their rules, they keep their rules, and they got no heart for God. And then on the other side, we get these licentious people that, hey, everything's forgiven, I'm just gonna live any way I want. So we just sin that grace might abound. And so the enemy is always working to keep you from Jesus. In Romans 1 through 11, he's always trying to keep you from coming to the finished work of Jesus Christ and resting in that alone. And then he's always trying to keep believers from love because that is what God wants from his children. This is the ultimate ethic of what God has always wanted from his children is love. And the devil would love for our good law-keeping without love to keep us from God, to have all the externals without the internals. The church in America, we're experts at that. 1 Corinthians 13, he says, you can be martyred. You can sell all that you have and give to the poor. You can prophesy with the tongues of angels. You can do all these things. And if you have not love, you're a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. You can get all the externals down and do mighty things. I mean, you can be martyred and miss the whole thing. If you don't have love, you've missed what God is driving his children to. You can get in a marriage and keep all your vows, obey your roles, and not even love your spouse. I've I've had many who who just try to do an end around uh, God by good law keeping, good duty with no love. You've missed the whole gospel. The freedom that could be yours this morning is I've just been praying fervently for shackles of law to fall off that you might fulfill the law, or Paul said, is to love from a sincere and pure heart. That's the obedience of faith that Paul is working for in Romans at the beginning and the end. This is the end game for the child of God. This is what Paul is wanting to see from the top of the mountain, uh, Mount Denali, just to look out and see this is what he's wanting from his people. There's this love that fulfills the whole law. And so I want to go to our God and ask him to increase our love this morning as we open up this word and look at the beauty of what Paul has for us. Father, we are at the top of of the Christian ethic. As we look out from all that we've been learning, this is what you want from your people. This is what the gospel produces in hearts. And we live among a people who miss it. We live in our own hearts who love to get going through rituals and lose our first love and lose our love for the brethren. Lord, we like rules better than relationship. God, we, we look at Pharisees and we can condemn them and we're Pharisees in our own hearts. God, I pray this morning, that you will lead and guide us, that your spirit will reveal the beauty of the summing up of all things in Jesus Christ, and that love fulfills the law. God, give us wisdom and give us insight and change hearts and futures and lives here this morning. Increase our love. God, grow us in love for you and for others as a result of our time of worship in this word this morning. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So let's set the stage for this passage in Romans 13, 8 through 10. Uh, You need the the context if you're ever going to get this. (coughs) And I've been known to like long introductions. But this morning, the whole sermon is an introduction. 
okay? And next week, we're, go- we're going to exegete the verses. Who said amen? I want to buy you coffee. <laughs> Did your wife make you say that? That was beautiful. <clears throat> so we want to set the stage. And guys, we're just going to survey the whole Bible, and I want you to see what we are looking at. If you get this, this is what ties the whole Bible together. And so come on a journey with me. We're going to go over things that I've been saying for 20, 30 years, uh, things that you've heard. Some of you have never heard this before, and let's all journey together because it has become so fresh on my heart this week that I'm I'm hoping that all of you will get the blessing that I had in my study. Uh, The first thought is I just want to start with the fall is God creates and Adam and Eve sin and we're now separated from God and he puts the angel in the garden with the sword that moves in every direction. There's no way back into the presence of God by our doing. Okay, so the, Adam separates, he doesn't keep the command, now we are separated from God and we watch God's uh, way, he's going to fix this and he makes a promise in Genesis 3 that he'll fix it. And then Abraham comes on the scene. And God comes to Abraham, he sends him out, and he says, Abraham, I'm going to bless the nations through your seed. And so there's, there's going to be a singular seed, Galatians, Paul, when he wrote it, told us, that's going to come in the world and he's going to fix this problem of man being separated from God, being guilty, and the wrath of God upon them. And it says that Abraham believed God, and it was Logizomite, it was reckoned to him as righteousness. The righteousness of God was put to Abraham's account by believing that God would do everything necessary to fix this. And so we got the whole, the whole foundation of the Bible now on this promise. God says, by grace, through faith, I'm going to do everything necessary to bless you and all the nations who have the faith of Abraham. And so it's just this gorgeous foundation is laid But the problem where most of us have run into conflict in our Christian life is about 430 years later, God now comes and he gives Moses the law on Mount Sinai, and we call it the Mosaic Covenant. And it comes and it, it's very prescriptive and there's a lot of thou shalls and thou shall nots. And, and we're told that it revealed the righteousness of God. There's nothing wrong with the law. It's righteous and it reveals here's righteousness. And the summary is obey this and live, disobey and die. And that is really the rest of the Old Testament. It's a nation that has been called out by God with the Mosaic covenant failing miserably. Again and again, kings rising up, people missing it. And the day of Christ comes and the Pharisees are striving so hard to keep the laws of Moses and all the new ones that they added that that he's saying, "You, you clean the outside of the cup, but the inside's dirty. He says, you're whitewashed tombs and all of your moral law keeping isn't helping you. It's not fixing anything. It's making you worse. So here's where it gets tricky for me. There's a promise that was made to Abraham. I'm going to save you by grace through faith. I'll do all the work. And Moses, here's a law. Keep it. Disobey and die. They're so contradictory. So which is it? Well, my thought is, well, it's Moses because it came later. So keep the law that you might have life. And I'll tell you right now, that's the history of the world. People trying to keep the law that they might have life to live a right kind of life so God will save them and bless them. Every cult is built on this foundation. Too many Christian circles are built on this foundation. The remaining sin in my my own heart, to think that God could be happy with my externals, me keeping rules, when my heart is far from him. There's remaining sin in my own heart that fights this. And so I need some help this morning with why did God give a law? Why did God give it to Israel? What was its purpose? Because in the law, the righteousness of God is revealed, and the psalmist said, I I love thy law. And I want you, if you could, to turn over, keep your hand in Romans, and turn to Galatians 3. (coughs) I want you to hear Paul answer this question. So if this is new to you, keep tracking, because this is the foundation of the whole hope of salvation in your Christian life. Galatians 3.15. Brethren, I speak in terms of human relations, even though it's only a man's covenant, yet when it's been ratified, 
No one sets aside or adds conditions to it. So once it's ratified, you can't change it. And now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. And he does not say to seeds as referring to many, but one and to your seed, that's Christ. So I'm going to bless the nations through a singular one, Christ. And what I'm saying is this then. (coughs) The law, which came 430 years later, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God, the Abrahamic covenant, so as to nullify the promise. So the law can't do away the the Abrahamic promise. It can't nullify it and say, done, I want to go with this. For if the inheritance is based on law, it's no longer based on a promise. That's good logic. If it's done by you keeping rules, then it can't be Abrahamic, so that the two can't stay together. But God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. Why the law then? Thank you, Paul. It was added because of transgressions. Having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed should come to who the promise had been made, Jesus, now a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. Is the law contrary to the promises of God? That's what I'm asking. I love his answer. May Ginnatoy, may it never be. For no way. For if a law had been given which was able to impart life, if you could have got saved keeping that law, then righteousness would have been based on law. It was never designed for that. But the scripture has shut up all men under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Abrahamic covenant. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, the Mosaic law, being shut up to the faith which was going to later be revealed in Jesus. Therefore, the law has become our tutor. Our tutor to what? To lead us to Jesus Christ. That we may be justified by faith in Jesus Christ alone. The law is going to tutor you. It's going to lead you to Christ Therefore, um, but now that faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor. And I want you to hear that. Now that faith has come, Jesus, we're not under a tutor. We're not under the law. For you are all sons of God now through faith in Christ Jesus. For all who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free man, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus And if you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. So I want you to see that when Adam sinned, the way back to God by our righteousness was closed forever. There's only one way back into the presence of God, and it's not by your law keeping, it's by God's. There has to be a Redeemer sent into the world to fulfill the law. So I want you to flip over to Romans 3. Why the law? He tells us a couple of things that we've already learned in Romans, and I'm just going to read a couple of them. Uh, Let's actually start in verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, this is Mosaic law, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, For through the law, this Mosaic law, comes the knowledge of sin. Now flip over to Romans 5.20. The law came so that the transgression would increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Now go back to Romans 13. So why the law? I want to remind you what Paul has said. It's to provoke outright rebellion. It's to say... You know, thou shall not, and your flesh says, yes, it will. Yes, it will. Then it's to show the depth of your sin that's in there. And when the law says, don't do this, it now becomes a transgression against God. God has given you a revealed will, and you're now crossing it, shaking your fist at God, saying, oh, I'll live any way I want. So sin now has become a transgression. Then it provokes religious people to try to make it be a ladder, that I'm going to climb my way into heaven. And Paul says it's designed to shut your mouth 
in regards to righteousness. The law was given so you'll quit saying, I'm good enough. I'm better than my neighbor. I'm more. It's defining just everyone to be shut up before God and say, I'm a filthy sinner and I can't change and I can't fix and I can't, I can't fulfill this law that demands perfect righteousness. My mouth is shut before God. That's why the law. So now I'm blind and naked and wretched and poor. And Jesus says to enter this kingdom, you got to come in poor in spirit when you finally realize I, I can't do it. I can't clean up enough and be good enough. That might be the water to a man in the desert this morning if you're here trying to clean yourself up and get your way into the kingdom. God designed the whole thing to fail at that. So it would tutor you to Christ. That you would come and receive the promise that was made to Abraham that Jesus Christ would come and He would fulfill the law. And so the law served the gospel. It wasn't two different ways to get right with God. It was saying it's going to be through Jesus Christ and His work alone. The law is going to come and show you that you need His work. That yours can't be enough. So the law is beautiful. It's going to lead you to Jesus. And that's what I love about the law. It's, it's, it's going to shut your mouth. But you might come to Jesus Christ and find eternal life. Thank you, God, for the law. So my question is, did God not mean then what He said in the law? It was righteous. And it, and it showed what real righteousness looked like. And it prescribed punishment for the one who didn't keep it. The soul that sins must die. How do you just nullify the law of God. I'm changing it. You can't just say, law's over. Now it's grace. It didn't mean what it said. Oh, I changed my mind. Let's just pull the law off the table. That would be unrighteous. God can't do that because He's righteous. He can't just say, done. It had to be fulfilled because God meant what He said. And that law had to be perfectly fulfilled in order to come back into the presence of a relationship with God. No human could fulfill it. That was the design of the law. I pray you stop trying this morning if you are. So one called the Son of God was incarnated into a human body. And he came into this world and he, he fulfilled the law. He fulfilled it to all of it perfectly in regards to righteousness. And then he paid uh, the, the penalty for our transgressions of the law. Cursed is everyone who does not obey all the commands written in the law. And he went up on a cross and he paid for what all of our transgressions deserved in the law by not keeping it. And so I want you to get this. Jesus said, don't think I came to abolish the law or prophets to just yank it away. I didn't come to abolish, but to fulfill. I came to fulfill the law. This is big. He didn't come into the world to just keep some rules. He came and he was himself. He didn't come and keep a standard. He was the standard. Jesus came and lived who he was. He lived perfect righteousness on this earth. He came and revealed to us in flesh and blood what does a true son live like, think like, and act like. He manifested perfect righteousness. What a perfect son or daughter lives like. Basically, if I just summarize it, and I'm stealing from the Bible, he loved God with all of his heart, mind, soul, and strength, and his neighbor as himself every second of every day. And our passage says, love fulfills the law of God. And so love incarnate, God is love. He came and he lived it out perfectly. He fulfilled it. Law fulfilled. And it was beautiful. If you read the Gospels, I love to read it and look at the righteousness of Christ. And that's mine. It's why he messed with the Pharisees. You're, they're like, you're not keeping our laws. He's not holy. They're always looking at the legal code trying to trap him. While his love is just being manifested daily all over Palestine. And it's, it's how they are crucifying an innocent man and saying, let's wait till Passover's over. We don't want to be unclean. Why we kill the Son of God? It's why he could heal a man and they're upset. He, 
He healed a man on the Sabbath. Rules without getting what it was all about. It it flows today. It's flowed throughout history. Our text is saying love is the fulfillment of the whole law. I want you to hear just a couple texts to have your conscience that this isn't just me. Galatians 3.24, Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ that we could be justified by faith. Romans 10.4, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Who has the faith of Abraham and that seed. Romans 8.2, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. And Galatians 3, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. It is such clear language. And that Paul says, therefore we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of of the law. That is what tutors us to Christ, to believe that He came and He fulfilled the law's demands in my place. And the way I receive it is by faith and not by the works of the law. So we've gone over this a lot. And my question to you this morning, why Romans 12 through 16? What, what do we do now as justified believers loved by God and accepted? And we, we've turned from our, do, uh, uh, we're, we're, I'm sorry, we have turned from his doing, that's all we've been learning in Romans 1 through 11 now to our doing. We believe we're justified. What do we do now? What do we do with the law as the children of God? And I want you to hear a verse that earlier was life changing for me. Hebrews 7, 12, for when the priesthood is changed, the, the Melchizedek, the Judah, is, there's the new priest. And when the priesthood is changed, which is Jesus, of necessity, there takes place a change of law also. Mosaic law, completed, fulfilled, a new priest. There needs to be a new law for the new covenant. Not just external laws, internal, beautiful laws. Hebrews 7, for on the one hand, there's a setting aside of a former commandment, Mosaic, because of its weakness and uselessness in getting righteousness. He said, for the law made nothing perfect. And then on the other hand, there's a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. So there's a setting aside the Mosaic covenant, the former law, because it couldn't get you righteous. So Jesus comes and fulfills it so that you could receive righteousness. And in this, we're going to see the glory of the gospel. And in Hebrews 8, he says, when you see, when, when he said a new covenant, He made the first obsolete. Write that word down, obsolete. So when when he says a new covenant, that old one is obsolete. And whatever is becoming becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. Some of you, it's hard to let go of Moses. It's disappearing. It's obsolete. But am I going to be lawless? What's my standard? What's my moral code as a child of God? What comes out on the other end of the new covenant? I'm going to do this quick. We've talked about it a lot, but I think it's important. Um, Thomas Aquinas, about the 10th, 9th or 10th century, he took the Mosaic law and he broke it out into three categories. And he broke it out into judicial. And there's these laws about a nation, of how you should behave. And this is where today we're, we're always asking what comes forward into the new covenant. And there's this thing called theonomy that, that says what, what comes forward is the judicial and America needs to live like all the rules for Israel and we need to make our country be that and we've got to legislate all of these things. And so we bring the judicial forward. <coughs> the second is the ceremonial. And that was the sacrificial system. That was offering up the animals and the priesthood and all of those things. And, and does that come forward? And, and the Messianic Jews will say, yes, the, we keep the days and the feasts and circumcision. And we, we move that and say, yeah. That's God saying Mosaic Covenant is gone. <laughs> and the third part is the moral, which is the Ten Commandments, the righteousness of God. In, in saying, well, that has to come forward. And so we're still under those Ten Commandments and we need to be keeping the Sabbath then. 
And so they've been debating throughout church history what comes forward in the new covenant. And so Don Carson said, I want you to notice something as you look at the Mosaic Covenant. The law never makes those distinctions. They feel really good, judicial, ceremonial, moral. But he says morals through the whole old covenant. It's, it's all over the place. It, you can't break them into those nice, tidy little sections. So we are debating the wrong thing. This covenant always says it was given as a whole. It's a, it's a covenant. It's all together. And Jesus came and didn't say, hey, I came and fulfilled the ceremonial law. He says, I came and fulfilled the whole law. Every bit of it. And Romans 6.14 was a life changer for me. In sanctification, he says, sin shall not be master over you. Well, how, how not? You're not under law. That's the Mosaic law. But you're now under grace. And now there's a way that you're going to become more holy than living under the Mosaic covenant. There's a better way to get real righteousness. And let me try to show you what comes out then on the other end. So I like this little hourglass. Moral, ceremonial, judicial. Jesus comes. He fulfills everything. What comes forward now for us? That's a big question. And I'm going to call what comes forward the royal law, the law of Christ. And I want to read a couple passages to just give you the New Testament flair. James says in James 1.25, one of you looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty. I love that phrase, the law of liberty, the new covenant, putting it in our heart and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer. This man shall be blessed in what he does. And then James 2.8, if however you are fulfilling the royal law, according to scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. <clears throat> one last one. You're going to have to track with me. Paul says, though I'm free from all men in 1 Corinthians, I made myself a slave to all that I might win the more. And to the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might win Jews. And to those who are under the law, as under the law, though not being under the law myself. So when I go evangelize Jews, I'll stay under certain things that they're keeping so I can evangelize them, though I'm not under the law. This is Paul. I'm not under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those who are without law. So I, those who aren't under law, I am under law. I'm under the law of Christ, and I'm not under the Mosaic law. So there's some really clear distinctions going on here that we need answers for. And so what is this? What is the royal law, the law of liberty, the law of Christ? You're going to hear it from me till you die. It's Romans 13, 8 through 10. <clears throat> Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, here's your Ten Commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. If there's any other commandment, it's summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbors yourself. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. The law of Christ is love. There is something that God has been after. We, we studied it uh, in Romans 8, that he's always been after love, even in the old covenant. The law isn't a, just a list of rules. It's how you love. And I'll tell you this right now, if you love your neighbor, you know what? You won't murder them you love your neighbor, you won't take their wife. You won't lie. You won't steal. God has always wanted our hearts, and he wants our hearts to be like him. And God is love. And that's how Paul could make such bold statements here in Romans 13. And I think he got it from Jesus. When the Pharisee heard that they'd put the Sadduce Sadducees to silence, they gathered themselves together. <clears throat> and one of them, a lawyer, it's always the lawyer, and he asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. A quote from the Old Testament. And this is the great and foremost commandment. And the second one is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments, depend, means to hang. It's like two pegs. The whole 
moral economy of the uh, hang the whole law and the prophets. So the whole Mosaic covenant hangs on these two pegs, to love God and to love others. The law of Christ, the royal law. And Jesus says, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And the fulfillment of the law is love. Christ came and he gave us that. He loved God with a passion that could never be moved away or or ever decline. And he loved his neighbor as his own self all the way to the point of laying down his life on a cross for his enemies. Galatians 5, For you were called to freedom, brethren, only did not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, here's the law of Christ, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is all over the Bible. Love is the aim. Loving your neighbor is satisfying what God has always wanted from us. It's a lot easier to keep rules and be raunchy and cranky and nasty than to love. Love fulfills the whole law. It's the substance of the law. And so get this, love is not against the law. It's what the law was pointing to. It's fulfilled. The whole law has been pointing to this. Love doesn't contradict law. The law will be written upon our hearts. The disposition to love God and others are written in our hearts when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. That's the new heart that he gives us. So don't fall apart. If you love someone, you'll never kill them. You'll never lie. You'll never steal. Love will bring about the most excellent morality that there ever could be. It's just excellent love. Love like no other. That's all we've seen in Romans 12. Love, love, love. He just keeps teaching us the the highest standard of the new covenant is to love one another. It always goes higher and higher to where I can rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Love is the fulfillment of the law. And what the law forbids, love forbids. One man said this, love's bent fulfills the law's intent. Love's bent fulfills the law's intent. Love carries out the intent of the law. The law is love in action. You shall love your neighbor as your own self. You should love your neighbor as your own self. And Jesus comes, you know what he does? He takes it higher. And he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you. I take your breath away. It's one thing to say, love your neighbor as yourself. That's big and no one can keep it. Love your neighbor as yourself, even as I have loved you. That is the ultimate law of Christ. High as it goes, love as I have loved you. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And against such things, there is no law. Law isn't going to get that. But coming to Jesus Christ and, and being joined to him and believing this gospel, a fruit can come out called love. Law can never produce that. The gospel can produce a supernatural love like anything else. The law, don't do. Thou shalt not, don't do. The law of Christ, love as I have loved you. Love, pray for them, bless them, feed your enemies, rejoice, give preference to one another, and honor. Love. Thomas Schreiner, the the commentator, said, Love always seeks what is good and edifying for others and does not consent, content itself with calculating whether it's fulfilled the proper rule or not. What's the proper rule? It's just saying, love just says, how do I do the best for this person? I just move out. I don't, I'm not just this big rule machine running around. I just keep rules. I just have a heart that loves and moves out. You can't fake this. You can fake rules till the cows come home. This is the only explanation for why you can keep law and not be a lover. I've met some of the meanest people who are just good at keeping rules. 
This is the fulfillment of the whole law. Love. So let's close this introduction. <laughs> Paul says, owe nothing to no man except to love. But my question is, how do I pay this debt? This has been the question of my heart for 30 years. How do I pay this debt? And is it just staring at Moses? Looking at my rules and, and trying to go keep my rules? Or is it loving? Paul says, if you love, you fulfill the law. So is my focus Moses or Jesus Christ? And this is so big. So big. There's a whole movement in America and in a whole denomination that says, you look at Moses. Law leads you to Jesus, and Jesus points you back to Moses. Go back to Moses now and keep law. We've seen that the law is a tutor. It leads you to Jesus Christ. Christ doesn't say, go back to the law. Go back to some shadows. Go back over there. He's saying, I'm it. I'm the fulfillment. Hear this. The law never pointed to itself. It pointed to Jesus. Come to Jesus and don't go back to Moses. He fulfilled all of its demands. It's ready to disappear. It's vaporizing. It's done. It served its purpose. Well, I needed to tutor. Try this tutoring someone. Love as Jesus Christ has loved you. Who can keep that? Be perfect as your heavenly Father's perfect. We can tutor people like crazy to show their need of Jesus Christ. Now my sanctification and my growth and holiness is in reference to Jesus Christ and not to law. And some of you, your whole reference is law. And that's why you're not growing. Your, your reference is law. Am I keeping it? I'm in shame. I sit under it. There's no power. I just stare at myself and law and I'm dying and I'm miserable. Why am I not growing in holiness? Because you went back to Moses. Come to Christ. My commandments are not burdensome. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law, and I want you to hear this. He's our focus, he's our motivation, and he's our standard. I don't need tablets, I got Jesus. And he's God incarnate showing me how to love. We have the enfleshment of righteousness that walked on this earth. And we get to see what it looks like in a human being. I love having a human instead of a moral code to learn how to do this. And I get to look at Christ. So when I say, give me Jesus, I mean that with the whole fiber of my being, give me Jesus for everything. And now one last thing and I'll let you go. No, we've got to have communion. Romans 7. And we keep going back to this because this one changed my life. This is when it finally clicked. Where do I go to get holy as a believer? <clears throat> One through three. Do you not know, brethren, from speaking to those who know the law? The law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he's living. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law concerning the husband. So then if while her husband is living, she's joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so she is not an adulteress, though she be joined to another. And so she can remarry now uh, because she's not under that law anymore. He died. And so if you die under to this law, you're free to get remarried. Now come to verse 4. You know my favorite word, therefore. Think through this. Therefore, my brethren, you also are made to die. You didn't die to your spouse you died to the law. Mosaic law. If someone says, why doesn't Paul just make it clear? <laughs> you were made to die to the law. How did I die to the law? Through the body of Christ. I died to the law by Him dying on a cross in my place. And so that you might be joined to another. That's the same word three times for marriage. In the verse before. So you can be married to someone else. Who? Him who was raised from the dead. You can be joined to Jesus Christ. They tutored you to Christ. I can die of the law because I can be married now to Jesus Christ. And this marriage, he 
He's going to use what's called a henna clause. The purpose is what? That you might bear fruit for God, which I'm going to say is love, the fulfillment of the whole law. And so the way you're going to get holy is by dying to the law and quit trying to fulfill it and keeping it and living under its condemnation. But to come to Jesus Christ and see him fulfilling all of the law's demands. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And by living in faith in this marriage, little blossoms are going to come up. And they're going to be called love. Love to God. They're organic. They start coming from this relationship. And the relationship to law will never produce this fruit. And I've, I, as a pastor, I've done it myself, and I've watched a bunch of you do it. When you live under law, you don't love. You're always consumed with yourself. You're navel-gazing. You're, you're just lost in law and condemnation and self. It will never bear what God's wanting to put in your life. To realize it's all been fulfilled in Jesus Christ, and there's no condemnation. I am now loved by God and accepted and I am in a marriage to Jesus Christ, the best marriage. I love my marriage, but I like this one a million times more. It is better than anything to be married to Jesus Christ. And that marriage bears fruit called love. Just look at verse 6, Romans 7, 6. But now we've been released from the law. Clear? <laughs> we've been released from the law, having died to that by which you were bound, the law, so that we serve in newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. We serve now in the Spirit of, of the Holy Spirit, pointing us to Jesus and manifesting the fruit of the Spirit called love. So we are joined to another. Uh, we, we're to, this is not lawlessness. It fulfills the law to love. Paul's going to say in a couple more verses, put on the Lord Jesus Christ, look to Christ, fix your eyes on Christ. So in closing, have I said that a few times? Sorry. In really closing, God set his love on me before the foundation of the world. Do you remember that word foreknew? Before God created the world, he set his love on me. The love that I've always been looking for, he foreknew me. Don't ever get over that. And in love, God sent His Son into this world. And in love, He died on a cross in my place. And in love, God awoke me. And I believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And He's going to glorify me forever and ever and ever. And this morning, nothing can separate me from His love. Not even myself. My well-doing and my good-doing isn't going to change it. And there's a God who rejoices over the one who was a bag lady that hated him and was his enemy. And Paul says, this, this love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Spirit. And the Spirit speaks this into our hearts, this infinite love that God has. And, and now, we're going to see next week, you're a debtor to love other people. God pays debts and it makes us indebted not to pay back God, but to go love other people. That I may love them as freely as God has loved me. That I'm going to try to have a height, depth, breadth, and a length of my love for others. That I might give of myself. That I might lay my life down that others would hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to do Romans 12. I want to do 1 Corinthians 13. I want that good Samaritan that we read about. Guys, this is the new covenant. And I pray you're not missing it with a bunch of rules while you don't love. This is what God wants from his children. We love because he first loved us. A love that will not let me go. And now my love won't let you go. <clears throat> now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Liberty. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. And I believe that we strain gnats all day long with good law keeping while we swallow camels called love. The history of the church. Romans 14, what's right? You know, whether you eat meat or not. And Paul never gives you the answer. <laughs> It says, receive one another. Love. 
Owe nothing to anyone except to love them. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. And so dare I say that looking at commandments will never produce this. Dare I say that looking at yourself will never produce this. Look at Jesus. Enjoy your marriage. And the fruit of love will bubble up. That's where this is going to flow. How's the view from Denali? You like it? Love is the fulfillment of the law. It's what God wants from his children. Are you missing this? with all your law keeping and no heart. I want you to be set free this morning in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what we could go on forever, what this means to marriage is parenting the body of Christ. Um, I'll save that for next week. So let's come to the table and look at this love. And may it flow like a stream from every heart here this morning to every person we come in contact with this week. This is love incarnate, what we remember now. Father, I, I pray that our hearts would be made glad as we look and remember Jesus Christ and the great sacrifice that he did for our sins. God, that he fulfilled the law, he didn't destroy it. And now we can get to the heart and the essence of what that law required. God, I pray that his love would, by faith, flow into our hearts. That love would work its way out in a million different ways from the people sitting in this room. God, we don't need tablets. We need Jesus. We need the Holy Spirit to lead us to love, to, to, to just learn all the ways to love and help each other on the way to glory, to love the lost and care. Oh God, fill our hearts with agape for all. Let us love the way you do by the Christ that we're joined to through your Spirit. God, produce love by faith in every heart here this morning. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.